On Tuesday, we talked about Darwinism. And as uh, 21st century people, very familiar with current Darwinian debates, uh, which are fueled by the materialism of biological sciences and genetics, we look at Darwinian evolution as a very materialistic discourse. But that actually is an idea that comes later. While we're in the 19th century, remember that black box mechanism of natural selection isn't really all that understood. It's a brilliant idea, but really, without genes, there's no proof. How do you pass along a variation onto the next generation so that nature can, in fact, create species? So in the 19th century, one can easily choose to create an accommodation, still be evolutionary, still be progressive, still subscribe to a scientific framework in which to understand biology and speciation and even the origin of man. However, they don't quite have all the information they need to make that synonymous with totally materialistic mechanisms. So there's space now within this, um, within this evolutionary model. There's still space to find accommodation. This feels like really loud. Less loud, OK? No. OK. Happy medium. OK. All right. OK. So, oh my god, that's so loud. All right, religion can, so, well, what is this accommodationist model? Well, it's an accommodationist model where we talked about Buckland, who was the geologist who first really, really wanted to force the point that uh, the biblical flood was one of the catastrophic mechanisms that shaped the planet. He kept wanting to reconcile French geology with uh, as much scripture as he could, but in the end he couldn't do it. He backed off, found an accommodation, and said, you know what? Let religion consult science in matters of nature and where it's going to get too, and too cumbersome to carry along too much of this scriptural baggage. What do I mean by scriptural baggage? Say the part where Jonah ate the whale. Or no, no, the whale ate Jonah. <laughs> I'm up on my Bible scholarship. Now, OK, that's a bit of baggage, right, if you're a scientist. And remember, this is an elite accommodation between scientists um, and religionists, because a lot of times, still within these major universities, the people teaching the science are oftentimes the people who are going to be instructing you from the pulpit on Sunday. That the church is still very much involved in, um, in discussing, promoting academic ideas. The universities themselves require a um, a declaration of faith to the 39 articles. You have to say you believe in the Anglican Church in order to hold a chair. And so if you are going to be responsible for teaching scientific knowledge, and you are also the person who is in custody of religious knowledge, of course you're going to seek an accommodation. Why? Well, you draw your personal authority from both those things. And so there was a strong drive to strike a position down the middle. And the way we did that in evolutionism, just to reiterate, survival of the fittest, OK, that can sound kind of like a, a grim um, red and tooth and claw fight to the death, uh, right, ma might makes right. But you could also look at fitness as one of the mechanisms God employs to improve us. And part of that improvement is nature, is becoming physically superior. But if you look at the overall evolutionary scheme, it does seem to imply life is developing more and more along moral complexity, social complexity, right? You could look at people, the Victorians looked at themselves and said, well, we certainly see more moral than our 13th century um, predecessors. And so it was easy to take this pro evolutionary model and make it progressive. Also, there's this sort of convenient distancing of God. We know that now in the evolutionary model, God is working through mainly these 
mechanisms, these features he puts into nature to drive improvement um, in species. So rather than have that static divine order where everything is put in place by God, you have this progressive model where God steps back and he lets his laws work for him. And so rather, you have a natural hierarchy of the fit, reflecting God's moral hierarchy. Now that means if you happen to be the most fit, you must in some way be occupying a superior privileged position on the world that has some kind of moral dimension to it. Now, doesn't this seem like it would be very appealing for the British, who at this point, 1859, 1860s, becoming easily the most powerful nation on Earth. Their industrial um, revolution is going gangbusters. They are at the brink of an imperial expansion that will uh, you know, project British power over a quarter of the globe. They are in so many ways astride the earth by brute force. And now, thanks to Darwinian evolution, brute force also has a kind of moral ballast to it. Might makes right, survival of the fittest, God's moral, uh, moral order working through natural selection. We're on top. I guess this is morally okay. So you see how there's an element of social determinism to the adoption of this Darwinian model as well. So as much as it's working out in the middle, and as much as people both in the uh, religion, politics, society, your average Joe, scientists, all have a stake in moving forward and taking this accommodation, this uh, uh, between science and religion, moving it forward, they all have a stake in that. Is it really gonna be that easy? Because this is fundamentally a different world. Is science and religion gonna be able to advance in the same kind of harmony, holding up the same kind of mutual support as they did in Newton's era? And Newton understood that there was absolutely no distinction when he practiced science, when he looked through his telescope into the sky, he was, in a way, um, closing his eyes and meditating in prayer upon God. Those were the same exact activities. But science and religion are going to find they can't move forward with that model. And so there's a sense of looking for alternatives. Now, some of the push against too much accommodation between science and religion comes from the religious right. And these are the elites uh, on the religious right, not the fundamentalists. And they found something called the Victorian Institute in the 1860s. And they're a group of scientists who noticed that with Darwin and with all the support his theory has gotten, and with this aggressive stance fellow scientists have said, have made and said, back off, you have no right to curb or curtail you know, um, scientific thought about the nature of um, natural matters. You have, no, you have no right to do that. They're thinking, we need to rein this trend back. And so the Victorian Institute is founded with the express idea that science must be conducted in a way that supports religious belief. We're calling that reactionary because it wants to turn back time. It wants to dial back to the beginning of the century when, in fact, science was conducted in a way that supported religious belief. The model we have now is that science and religion, while not in any way expressly antithetical to each other, are conducted in a way that is largely independent. That is the more middle way we've been talking about. So this middle way, this progressive way would say, you know what, in order to maintain this accommodation between science and religion, we need to make religion more flexible, more progressive. We need to dump that Jonah in the whale stuff. We need to dump that literal creation of the Bible because quite frankly, when you try to argue that scientifically, you're gonna get taken down hard and it's making faith indefensible. Look what happened to Wilberforce when he had that confrontation with Huxley. He ended up being humiliated, or at least that's how it was represented in the press. So almost a defensive act of these progressives in the middle, and you could say this was the majority, was to say, 
let's just make science, let's just make religion more accommodating. So get this, the accommodation between science and religion is gonna come at whose expense? Religion, religion's gonna become more accommodating. And then finally, you have this other element, which is saying, absolutely not, I am not going to accommodate these new trends in science, and quite frankly, why should I? When we talk about the low church, we're often talking about popular people who have no stake in the prestige of the academy, who don't care that they're up on the latest science, they don't, their chair or holding their position and collecting their salary and social esteem is in no way tied to this new learning. So why should they encumber their religious faith with this, with this learning? So you have a tendency in the low church for people to become more and more recalcitrant, more fundamentalist and say, no, the word of God absolutely trumps any of these revelations in science. So, there are these three different ways of thinking about the, the future. But actually today, we're gonna to talk about a fourth way. A fourth way that is germinated in the hearts of people like Frederick Myers, William Crooks, you read about, Oliver Lodge, all of these people who were assigned this week. I'm sorry, what? Oh, okay, um, okay. And they're beginning to think, you know, this accommodation is not gonna work out because ultimately, as Frederick Myers writes, in spite of, and actually by reason of her studied neutrality, meaning science poses no opinion on the reality of religion. It is studied in its neutrality. The influence science is every year telling more strongly against belief in a future life. So even if science isn't pronouncing on the supernatural, its silence implicitly mitigates against belief in that. And inevitably, whatever science does not tend to prove, she in some sort tends to disprove. Belief will die out without a formal refutation. We don't need these scientists to come and say there is no God. If they don't prove it, belief is gonna die out anyway. Because if we can't find a, a place for religion among the copious store of verified and systemized facts, if we can't find a place for religion, guess what? Tomorrow there will be no religion. So people like Frederick Myers are looking at these people, these, um, these Unitarians, these broad church progressives who are gonna throw out the specific theological content in order to make an accommodation with religion. And Frederick Myers sees into the future and says, that is actually not a future that will guarantee the continued cooperation and coexistence between science and religion. That is a godless future because science will inherit the entire realm of knowledge to itself because that which she does not prove. That's how powerful science is. And that's how strong and compelling this discourse of empirical proof, this Lockean discourse of show me the facts demonstrate your argument. If you can't do that for God in heaven, God in heaven is going to wither and die. And this, of course, is um, an extrapolation of the pessimism of Hume, who says, a wise man proportions his belief to the evidence. I got a whole heaping mound full of evidence over here for Victorian scientific naturalism and its physical, biological, and chemical interpretations of the nature of man, huge mounds of evidence. And over here, I've got no physical evidence for the existence of God. Okay, I need to apportion my belief to the amount of evidence. Looks like, despite this model of reconciliation, Frederick Meyer sees into the future and sees that religion will find itself undefended. So we're just gonna take a moment to give you a sense of what this new, what Frederick Myers called, this new copious store of verified and systemized facts. Victorian science had come into its own. The sciences, through a confluence of various discoveries, had, had created a worldview, a system that was so mutually supportive, where biology and chemistry and physics and astronomy and geology and evolution are now drawing from each other 
to substantiate their arguments that they are more than the sum of their parts, that Victorian scientific uh, naturalism is a macro narrative that has the power to explain questions religion really can't anymore. When Darwinism gets assimilated into this scientific worldview, Victorian scientific naturalism can now actually tell you questions like the origin of species, the creation of man. Since when is that a question science can answer? But this science steps up and does answer it. They can look at a human body and understand that whatever that thing that animates it, it can be translated and understood according to the normal biochemical physical energies that can be mathematically quantified according to their sciences. They can tell you what life is. So we've just, these are two questions. What is the nature of life? What is the origin of species? What is the origin of man? Those were traditionally theological questions. So, so you see, science is expanding to annex what were traditionally religious forms of inquiry. And I'm just going to break down without going into do too much detail, but just so you get a sense of how things have changed. We've come into, you know, 18th century science was really more philosophical, social, and political. The big strides had been in physics with Newton, and we don't get huge advances really in the 18th century, maybe towards the end um, with new chemical theories and new electrical theories. But that is when this snowball of a new kind of knowledge begins, late 18th century to the middle of the 19th century. And here is the accumulation. First, you get John Dalton in the early 19th century, and he advances a theory about the atomic nature of matter. He is looking at matter, and he is figuring out that all of these chemical compounds are actually formed by more basic elements. And if you want to understand the nature of these elements, they're tiny little atoms. And these tiny little particle atoms, each is unique. So each element has its own signature atom. Major breakthrough. That is basically uh, the, the uh, founding, uh, the basic building blocks of modern atomic chemistry. So he gets it. We know from our discussion of Volta and um, Galvani that this matter was also understood to be the source of chemical and electrical types of energy. And so suddenly these very mysterious properties are folded into an understanding of matter that has an electrical nature, that has a chemical nature. And then remember we get Helmholtz. And Helmholtz is the one who says you can basically look at an organism and the energy that is vitalizing that organism is, in fact, not vital energy. It's chemical energy that converts to motor energy, causing your arms to move. It's a food that energizes your body and converts to chemical energy that converts to electrical impulses. So you see all of these mysterious energies are stuff we already know about. Chemistry, electri uh, electrical impulses, uh, traveling through nerves. It's all becoming reducible to the profoundly non-mysterious realm of scientific knowledge. Now, one of the most significant uh, experimentalists of the 19th century was Faraday. And he's going to take this science to a whole new level. He is the one that discovers the field nature of electromagnetism. So obviously, we have with Volta, we're figuring out that well, you can induce some kind of electrical flow with matter, but they don't really know what, uh, that they really don't understand the nature of the field. Faraday understands not just that force is a field surrounding matter, but then in fact, magnetism and electricity are related. They're two phases of the same force. And this is what he's able to do with this discovery. Magnetism has circular lines of force. So now you can harness magnetic energy and you can turn a wheel with those circular lines of force. He also knows that you can take this magnetic energy and if you disrupt it, you can induce an electrical current. 
that's the, gonna be the basis of our second industrial revolution. That's the basis of what we're living today. Electrical power plants, electrical motors, a form of energy that no longer revolves on, relies on wind or the mechanical energy of those big clattering machines of those um, 18th and early 19th century factories, which was fundamentally mechanical. This is going to be a new kind of energy, the biggest breakthrough in energy until we get, of course, the harnessing of atomic power. So now, electricity and magnetism, these mysterious forces are going to be folded into the furnace, the engine that drives civilization, and then we start to get a second industrial revolution that just goes gangbusters in the 1870s. Now, all of this, all of these ideas I've been talking about, the biological element, the chemical element, the um, electromagnetic aspect, gets folded into the first and second laws of thermodynamics, uh, most associated with the work of William Thompson, although it's um, a composite of, of many people's efforts. And these laws of thermodynamics, first, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can be, however, converted from one form to the other. That's what's happening in, in your body. Energy is never lost or destroyed. You eat food, what happens to that energy? It's converted into chemical energy. That chemical energy, in turn, feeds electrical um, currents through your nerve endings. You also are able to convert that into the kind of mechanical energy that we see in the, in the motions of our bodies. So not only is electromagnetism no longer seen as this weird, ghostly, mystical, alternative energy that must stream in from another dimension, it's just part of this workaday industrial world, part of the business of getting work done. So electromagnetism is now part of this world of energy where energy is converted from one form to another. Some of it is lost through dissipation. That's the second law of entropy. Um, but the important thing to keep in mind is all of the energy in this universe is now accounted for. And if you imagine the new model is not of a simple clockwork universe with its simple gears and gizmos, you can just pop it open and understand. Victorian scientific naturalism sees a world that has almost all the complexity that we're able to bring. It is a giant, clamoring, clanging, clattering industrial machine where chemical uh, energy, coal, is turned into heat. Heat is turned into motion, thermodynamics. That's the point, right? The real insight here for thermodynamics is that heat, rather than being some mysterious property of atoms, something radiant and magical, heat is the simplest thing in the world to understand. It's as simple as understanding as rubbing two sticks together. Everybody gets that. You rub two sticks together, it generates heat, heat and that, that can generate fire. There's nothing mysterious about this world. So I have here the new metaphor, not the clock. The new metaphor is of an industrial universe, right? And Britain is at the height of her industrial revolution. And we can see that um, this is linking the world of motion and energy through cause and effect, combustion, uh, chemical, um, electrical, motor energy, all of this energy everywhere and yet, you've accounted for all this energy. It's brilliant. You've been able to quantify it, right? They now, by 1873, they actually have the equations that are able to prove that electromagnetic energy is light. I mean, they've figured it all out, but nowhere can they find the ghost in this machine. And the other depressing thing is, in these laws of thermodynamics, no energy can get in and no energy can get out. Matter is neither created or destroyed. Energy is neither created or destroyed. So you see kind of Frederick Meyer's point? That which science cannot prove, and she's proving so much, she is depicting the world in a very vivid graphic way. And not only that, scientific knowledge is not just depicting the world, it's changing the world. There's transatlantic telegraph cables. There's uh, starting to erect buildings, colossal buildings of steel and train tracks. The landscape of this world is being ripped up. There are factories and cities, and so much change 
And religion just looks so fragile, so inarticulate. It seems so silent without the language of proof. It seems stultified. And now, sort of the piece de resistance, when you have this big, bold scientific philosophy, we've seen this over and over again, it gets its new epistemology. And we can see the threat that Fred Frederick Myers feels in his heart when we read the works of Auguste Comte, who um, is actually a French philosopher, but his works were extremely popular in England and um, translated in the 1850s and sponsored by major British intellectuals and agnostics like George Eliot, who, of course, the famous novelist, and Henry Luce, her um, husband, sort of. And so this is major intellectuals uh, sort of august, staid, non-revolutionary personages like uh, George Eliot are being forced to engage this new positivistic philosophy and its implications. So what is it that Auguste Comte is telling us? First, he's telling us that he's going to break the world down, the history of mankind in stages. And the earliest stage of mankind sort of grappling with truth and knowledge, in the earliest phase, they were religious. So the most primitive kind of understanding you could have, way, way back in antiquity, would be religious knowledge. The second phase was metaphysical. This is a little more sophisticated. Here we have our Aristotles and our Plato's who are saying, I'm going to argue for natural laws, an orderly systemic universe, but obviously reasoned from divine principles, right? One thing we know about uh, Plato, he, he elaborates his philosophy from the premise of forms, which is a metaphysical doctrine of God. Yet it's naturalistic, it's rigorous, it's um, mathematical, it's logical. But Auguste Comte says, still no good, not quite there. But now humanity has really got hold of something. In the final, most advanced stage of human knowledge, who are we? We are in the positive age, the age of incontrovertible facts, demonstration, proof. And you know how he knows this is the most powerful age? Look at what this knowledge has brought. Look at the, um, the wealth, the power, the transformation it has brought to society. Now, you can say that Plato was a genius, but one thing we can say about classical science in antiquity, it didn't have a technology. It didn't implement a scientific revolution. So Kant is pushing a philosophy that puts theology way, way down on the rung. You might as well just dig yourself a cave and go in it. And he's putting scientific knowledge way, way out on the forefront of discovery. And it's linked to higher forms of achievement and truth. And even it gets its own religious statement, the religion now of humanity. So now who's going to be the focus point, the focal point of this science? What is its moral objective? To serve humanity with this powerful form of knowledge which honors human capacity to know. And therefore, we don't need things like faith anymore. We need to honor our capacity to know things through our scientific discoveries, through our collection of facts, through our analytical reasoning. This is the atmosphere of the 1870s. So I talked about trying to find an accommodation. But you see how it's not going to be that easy, because the materialistic ethos of, of science, some of the implications, some of the moral implications that can be extrapolated from uh, William Thompson's thermodynamical universe, right, where all the energy is accounted for and none of it is spiritual, is depressing. John Tyndall, 1874 presidential address to the British Association for the Advancement of Science, comes out and says, the impregnable position of science may be described in a few words. We claim and we shall wrest from theology the entire domain of cosmological theory, all schemes and systems with us infringe upon the domain of science must, insofar as they do this, submit to its control and relinquish all thought of controlling it. What's he talking about? Religion. 
He's talking about uh, religion as one of the schemes and systems that wants to infringe upon the domain of science. And as far as it thinks it's going to do that, religion is going to find it under the control of science. In fact, scientists have now started to branch out into all sorts of disciplines, like um, the history of religion. Now you have all of these scholars who are poring over the Bible and not looking at it for like theological exegesis, what is God's message, they're looking at it to compare it to other historical documents to see if it's true or not. So this is religion being wrested into the domain of science. Now again, to reiterate, plenty of people in the middle, even William Thompson, the man I just uh, talked about, who's most associated with that description of a thermodynamical universe, He's not an atheist. He simply understands that science and religion have nothing to do with each other, that he has described a physical world that he can account for every scrap of matter, every bit of energy, materially, physically, numerically. And that's what he does. That's why when he practices science, it has nothing to do with religion. However, he's still very spiritual. And when he wants to contemplate moral issues, issues of God, Thank goodness he has church to go to on Sunday. That is the modern model. Science and religion, still profoundly important elements of modern truth telling, um, the search for guidance in today's world, are both hold these things up as valuable forms of understanding, but they're separate. So that's the Thompson model. But we also know that people like Frederick Myers were thinking, Thompson, you can't have it that way. You separate science and religion, and you unplug religion from this gangbusters body of knowledge, which is the new sort of voltic force that's charging people's belief system. You're going to unplug religion from the source of modern belief, which is proof and facts, meaning we need to prove God exists now. And or if you want to save religion, Religion is going to have to become an endeavor of science. So that's a new model. That's not science and religion is separate. And it's not science is a handmaiden of religion. It's science controls the whole domain. And religion is going to be a branch of its endeavor. So I'm going to talk a little bit about scientific spiritualism. But first, let's talk about some of its deeper roots. When we left off talking about mesmerism in the 18th century, remember it was driven underground because the French authorities, and the French are very good at formulating centralized authorities, had forbidden the practice. And ergo, you just didn't have the medical or popular pursuit of mesmerism in an open way. But what's going on across the channel? The British are a totally different animal, right? Newton had. Uh, made his laws of um, gravity and his laws of motion so transparent that discussing matters of physics was something just you know the average guy could do, tinkering in his shop. The laws of nature were relevant. They're not just relevant to your job or pursuing um, your industrial innovations. They were also, remember, seen as part of your spiritual growth, understanding nature, understanding God, understanding the Bible. These were all sort of unified, a unified religious project. And so when the Victorians find out about mesmerism, it's their um, sort of impulse to be hands-on and experimental and find out for themselves. This is the kind of independence they had always um, had in matters of religion. This is a Protestant country. And so people start mesmerizing each other all over Britain. They love it. Of course, you have your performance artists, you know, the people that will rent out a theater, throw on a turban, t uh, hypnotize you, tell you what's in your pocket, how many coins are in your pocket, um, tell you what your middle name is, all those kind of shenanigans that are now part of the daily sort of magic show. That is, uh, sort of starts with this performance mesmerism. But remember, the Victorians are independent, hands-on, empirical. They're out to prove things for themselves. So they do a little home mesmerism. And so you get these sort of games that are cropping up in parlor rooms. Uh, one of my favorites is called the willing game, 
where all the guests at the party would take an object, say a hairbrush, and they would hide it in a dresser drawer up in the third floor in somebody's bedroom, and then they would go downstairs, and there'd be one person in the party who didn't know where the hairbrush was, and then they would all join hands, like a conga line, except they wouldn't conga, and all focus, focus, focus on the hairbrush, transmitting the thoughts through their arms till it gets to the shoulder of the person who doesn't know where the hairbrush is, but they would will her to find it. And she kept finding the hairbrush. It was called the willing game. And as far as the Victorians were concerned, this was hands-on proof that there's something to this mesmerism stuff, that you can convey information from your mind to another mind without a verbal or external communication. So this got very, these beliefs got very, very entrenched in Victorian culture and in, a, in the way that had been inculcated by the elites as proper. It wasn't via enthusiasm, it wasn't via faith, it was via investigation, empirical proof and reason. And this mystical discourse of mesmerism that they were playing with, of course, was titillated with notions of, when you fall into a trance and you know where the hairbrush is, does that mean that you're accessing this higher form of consciousness? When you can read another person's mind, doesn't that imply that your mind can transcend your body? And doesn't that sound like it might be a spirit? OK, that's one way of looking at it. But then there was the more sober medical discourse of hypnotism. And this one was a little more of a drag, but we can see how it's still borrowed from in the mystical model. In the 1830s and 40s, you start to get the development of cable telegraphy. So by 1850, they'd actually like strung a cable underneath the English Channel, and you could just uh, tap away between England and France. This provided the model of brain activity. They sensed that uh, thoughts had an um, electrical nature. And so when you look at the metaphor of a cable, you've got one message going over here from London, traveling through electrical stimulation through a tube, arriving in Paris, just like a thought travels through your brain. So this model of the brain we got was like a bunch of cable wires tied together with electrical thoughts going through them. And remember, there's two electricities. You want to think electricity is something mystical? You can. If you want to think electricity is just part of this clanging industrial engine, well, there's plenty of evidence for that as well. Now, hypnotism to these people, to the medical model, was kind of an inferior thing. It's almost like you short circuit the brain, right? You mess up the wires, so all of a sudden the person is trapped in one part of their brain and they have no access to their higher consciousness. And that's when they'll do things like, you know, you ask them to shoot their mother and they'll shoot their mother. You know, people are in these trances and they're just quacking like ducks, um, acting like chimpanzees. And so the medical model is saying, there's really nothing that great or mysterious going on in your mind where you're really just losing most of it when you're hypnotized. Then we have the other people saying, no, when you're hypnotized, you uh, throw open the gateway to a greater consciousness. Two discourses. But we have to understand, not just being practiced on the fringe. This has entered into uh, the parlor rooms, the domestic context, into the theatrical context, into medical discourse in Victorian England. Not happening in France, big time happening in England. Here's another guy. We might, I bet you have heard of odic force, which is big in the New Age movement, this idea that everybody has an aura. Well, a very respectable chemist, Carl von Reichenbach, you know, he's doing things like, um, you know, analyzing coal and finding new uses for polycarbons. And he decides to take a look at this new kind of neurological energy, trying to interpret, well, is it really just these electrical impulses riding through these cable wires, or is there something more profound? So he's trying to take a medical, chemical discourse of mind, that's his background as, as a chemist, and he's trying to analyze mesmeric phenomena and he decides that the materialists don't have it right. That something, that these people are extremely sensitive. Some of them are extremely sensitive to other forms of energy. And that's why they're able to read each other's minds or they swoon and fall into trances. Other uh, sort of spooky things that happen when um, two people are mesmerized and they're caught in a mesmeric rapport. It's called a community of sensation. And one of the things the Victorians would do is, 
you would mesmerize your friend, and then you would put something in your mouth, and your friend would have to guess what you'd just eaten. And they kept guessing, like, oh, that tastes salty. And sure enough, you just put salt in your mouth. Oh, that tastes like orange juice. And there you have it. You just had a gulp of orange juice. So there was all of this mysterious stuff where mind seemed to communicate with mind. And Carl Reichenbach is trying to find some kind of model that can explain that. And he decides we all have these auras that radiate out of our bodies and that are part of the signature. They're more than just mental energy. They're an extension of our vital energy. And they touch each other, and they are able to read each other. And so he actually comes up with these scientific instruments, and he starts taking pictures of auras. And he shows that every single aspect, every element, all the chemical elements, even living matter, each has its own force. So you're getting these strange, conflicting discourses, some of them alchemical and magical, like Karl Reichenbach's, some of them very, very reductive, like the materialists who think, no, your brain is just electrical current and a cable. That is some of the background. That's what's going on in the 1830s and 40s when spiritualism hits. So when this uh, kind of new spiritual culture develops, we have to think it's already got a pretty strong mesmeric infrastructure. And mesmerism, remember, is elaborated in the context of science and medicine and brain science, right? So it makes sense that when we look at spiritualism, it's going to be totally inflected with this scientific discourse. I'm just going to do a uh, just really brief run through of history of spiritualism. Now, spirits have been pestering humans since time immemorial. I'm certainly not saying the first spirit to visit uh, human beings was in the 1840s at Hyde Park. But when we talk about this collection of cultural traits, the specific features of spiritualism, like if you ever go to the, um, what is it called, the House of Magic on Hollywood, on Franklin, and you go to one of their seances, it's a Victorian seance. It's got all the features of a seance the Victorians invented. What is that? It involves sitting around a table. It involves listening for table legs to wrap out a message from a ghost. It might involve a Ouija board or a planchette where a uh, sort of an arrow, you put your hands on the planchette and the arrow points to different letters, very much like a Ouija board. This idea of the Victorians were obsessed with communication, proving it, talking about it, hashing it out with the other side because you're actually having a discussion. All of that is Victorian, the turbaned lady with her crystal ball. Now, where does this all come from? Well, the first instance we can really find of the sort of the, the kernel of, that contains these features happens in Hyde Park. It's just a little, in a little barn in northern New York. There are these two girls, and they uh, live in a big farmhouse. There's a big haunted barn, and they keep running to the barn and screaming and saying, oh, there's a ghost in there. There's something wrapping. There's something, there's something um, you know, overturning the bales of hay, and there's, it's haunted. Then they get this bright idea, let's try to talk to the ghost. So then they start rapping on walls, and the ghost starts rapping back to them. Telegraphy. In fact, they started calling it spiritual telegraphy, just like doing that on the, uh, through the, um, the, tele the cable connecting London and France. We see how this is all historically situated. So now they've got a cable wrapping, wrapping, wrapping to the other side of the world, not just London and Paris, but the other side of the universe. So this now starts to get all sorts of attention, and they decide they need to communicate more clearly with the ghost. So they invite him to come on inside. They invite some neighbors over. They sit around a table, and then they start to have the first seance around a table. And funny things started happening to this table. With everybody standing around it, sitting around it, the table started to levitate. The table started to spin this way and that way. It would go all creaky. It would bang its legs on the ground to say yes or no or spell out words. And suddenly, this was all over the papers. And within two weeks of this being in the papers, it had jumped the Atlantic. It was in Germany. So everybody's got a kitchen table, right? So everybody in Germany now is sitting around. They're spinning tables. They're wrapping. They're knocking. Then the French find out about it. They're spinning tables. They're wrapping. They're knocking. Then the British find out about it, and they just go ape over it. They cannot stop with the turning and the spinning of the tables. Every parlor is turning and spinning, and they're chatting up ghosts. And it's all very respectable. 
Oh, you know, only respectable people have nice furniture that can spin. So this is very, you know, this is the elites are doing this, duchesses are doing this, housewives are doing this, and this is all good. Why? Victorians are asked to be very cautious about what they believe, to be very reasonable about what they believe, and they're conducting an experiment. They're merely looking for physical proof. They're not getting carried away by emotion. They are conducting an experiment. So we have to understand this early spiritualism as not wacky, well, I guess it's kind of wacky and kooky, but it's not what, how we would interpret it as a flight of fancy to them. It is the opposite. It is the empirical engagement of the unknown. It is more disciplined than merely going to church on Sunday. These are people that are really trying to understand faith using God's world, right? They had been encouraged to use God's world and understand God's world, and this is merely part of that culture. This becomes huge in England, much more so than in France and Germany, and part of that is because of, remember, this practical investigative spirit that had become kind of part of the cultural parlance of England. We got a craze, a full-on craze. And of course, once you get a lot of interest in spiritualism, then you get professional spiritualists, people who are particularly good at making the table spin or the ghost appear. So through the course of the 60s and the 70s, these phenomena get more and more elaborate. You get professional mediums who have spirit cabinets, and they'll have somebody lock them up, tie them up in the spirit cabinet, and then lo and behold, during the, se the seance, a ghost will emerge from the spirit cabinet. So they're actually able to materialize ghosts. And they start to get photographs of these phenomena because we're starting to have f photography um, quite po be quite popular in the 1850s and 1860s. And they're starting to get these photographs of strange luminous orbs now coming and visiting people when they conduct these seances and strange smells and apparitions and ectoplasmic excretions coming out of mediums mouths and nostrils and taking on ghostly forms soon because people are getting quite adept at contacting the other world soon you just don't have um, you know you don't have just little globes of light appearing in pictures soon you have full-blown spirit forms not just one spirit three four a dozen um, a dozen ghosts this is actually a picture from 1912 but um, it's really great. It just shows you the kind, this is, they're calling this ectoplasm, and this is a more electrical sort of interpretation of what it was. But uh, the term ectoplasm, I think, is probably from the 1870s or 1880s, and no one really knows what it is. They think it might be the internal plasmic dimension of matter that is sort of pried out of matter by a medium who has this confluence of energy. Her mental energy can break down matter and suck out this ectoplasm, then re-excrete it and make it, take it on forms. And this was their scientific explanation for how you might make a ghost appear. And it wasn't spiritualists who were providing the scientific explanation. It was physicists like Schrenk Noxing, a German physicist who was trying to sell this idea of ectoplasm. And even Sir Oliver Lodge, who at some point is president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. Even he has a couple of articles trying to puzzle out what ectoplasm was. Never occurred to them that it's probably just cheesecloth that somebody had chewed on and spat out during a seance. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, this is the important part. This is like a, um, there's, the public is willing, the public has their own investigative mania, their own discourse of proof and truth, but also spiritual beliefs were fed and modeled from on high. Some of the most elite scientists of the day were giving a sort of wealth of credibility that all the sort of scam artists who were out selling these pictures for ten dollars, you know, ten pounds of a photograph, a, a, a huge amount of money, they're not the ones with their pictures that are convincing everybody this stuff is real. It's the four or five scientists who have big, big names that are in the end the ones who are constantly cited as proof. One of these people is Alfred Russell Wallace. We've heard of him in this class before because, of course, he is the co-discoverer of natural selection with Charles Darwin. Who could be a more legitimate interlocutor 
for the spiritual cause than the guy that was part of advancing the most materialistic, depressing theory yet mankind had encountered, right? So um, Alfred Russell Wallace had huge amounts of legitimacy, and yet he had become fascinated by mesmeric phenomenon because he's trying to understand evolution, and yet because he felt this weird mesmeric stuff was actually happening, he felt Darwin hadn't gone far enough in explaining, um, in explaining evolution, that it wasn't just we have our five senses that, that, is being, that is interacting with our environment. We have this other capacity of mind, and that Charles Darwin needs to, under, needs to be able to explain what is it that produces this mesmeric capacity? What um, advantages there in nature? Is there biological advantages? Is this part of evolution? Or is it a part of us that stands outside of evolution? Is it the spiritual dimension that actually guides evolution rather than is guided by it? Nobody knows for sure, but Alpha Russell Wallace believes that this stuff is real, and he demands that science take account for it. From there, from uh, sort of an evolutionary interest in mesmeric phenomenon, he goes on to become involved in spirit photography. He never took these, this picture himself. This was, he went to the studio um, of a very famous photographer who was a scam artist, um, but unbeknownst to Alfred Russell Wallace. So um, Alfred Russell Wallace goes into the studio alone. He's very sad, he lost his mother. And lo and behold, when they develop the photographic plate, the first form that jumps out on the photographic plate isn't uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, it's his mother, and it's right there for all to see. Wallace knew that there was nobody else in that room with him when the picture was taken. He saw the plate, it was all sealed, it was a, it was a fresh plate. He watched it be developed. There's no way he could have been tricked. I, and he writes, I never for a moment contemplated the possibility that the marvels related by spiritualists could be literally true. No, not me. I'm a scientist. I would never believe in spiritualism. If I have now changed my opinion, it is simply by the force of evidence. Scientists must yield to the arguments of evidence. They cannot allow their prejudices to stand in the way. So as a truly enlightened and progressive scientist, he now yields to the incontrovertible fact, look, they're pictures of ghosts, they must be real. So Wallace on spirit photos. This is his scientific analysis of the, spirit, the, the mechanism. How does a ghost get into a picture? Well, remember, there's the materialistic understanding of light. In fact, at this point, they're kind of figuring out that light was essentially electromagnetic. And electromagnetism, remember, had been turned into this sort of uh, industrial source of energy, no great shakes. But also, when you talk about angels, you talk about light. When you head through the tunnel, you head for the light. You know, there's obviously a huge uh, rhetoric surrounding light as a spiritual source of energy. And so maybe, Alfred Wallace suggests, there's part of the spectrum of this um, light that we can't see and that has different properties. And this is the energy that actually constitutes our, our spiritual aspect. So he calls the actinic action of the spirit forms. That's just a fancy way of saying the light that comprises the spirit forms is peculiar. So it's a unique form of light and much more rapid than the light reflected from ordinary material forms. So it's not like the light coming out of that bulb and bouncing off the podium. It's this weird light, more like odic force, a light you emit from your body and that even after your body dies, this light stays there, but it's invisible. You can't see it. Reichenbach can only see it with special um, in, uh, scientific instruments. And so, um, and he says the reason why this develops so much faster is that light on that end of the spectrum is really rapid frequency and it stimulates the chemical transition to happen. So that's why my mother jumped out of the picture and it took my image hours to develop. Well, another way you could look at it is that the image was probably pre-exposed on the film and that's why it developed a lot more, um, a lot sooner. But you see, that you have one of the most important scientists of the day not going to argue fraud. You know, they were at, by this time, 1870s, they knew about trick photography, going out of his way to elaborate some actinic theory of ghostly light. Then he goes on about 
Someone asks him, some fresh person who's trying to make fun of him asks him about, oh yeah, then um, why are ghosts always dressed in bed sheets? And uh, Alfred Russell Wallace explains, look, if you are trying to project an image from another dimension, it is simply mentally exhausting to have to you know, project clothing and a body. So give a ghost a break. All right, so all they want, you know, they just have time to project their face and the rest was just shorthand. Um, so you see, he's looking for the laws of a yet unknown chemistry that will explain ghostly manifestations. Now, you have some of these scientists going gangbusters. And Alfred Russell Wallace, by the way, is going to become a friend of Frederick Myers the person that we talked about earlier on in the lecture was like, oh, woe is me. Religion is drowning in the materialism and despair that, in fact, I have this quote. Look, uh, he, he talks about this period that we're talking about right now. A time when not the intellect only, but the moral ideals of men seem to have passed into the camp of negation. We're all in the first flush of triumphant Darwinism where terrene evolution had explained so much that men hardly cared to look beyond. Among my own group, Clifford put forth a series of triumphant proclamations of the nothingness of God, the divinity of man. And then he goes on, blah, blah, blah. It was, I, sometimes it flashed into a horror of a reality that made the world swim before my eyes, a shock of nightmare panic and the pain and dreariness of a day as if the whole world was vanishing, not mine alone, and sinking into a crud of materialism. So. There are these scientists who feel like there's a horribly terrifying and desperate trend. Men like Alfred Russell Wallace and Frederick Myers very specifically see this is a problem only science can solve. But there's other scientists as well. People like um, Darwin's bulldog Huxley. We heard, we heard from him on Tuesday slapping around Bishop Wilberforce. He feels that science is humiliating itself by having these elite scientists caught in flagrante like this um, with ghosts and pictures taken with ghosts is absolutely humiliating and bad for science. So just so we know, there is a strong materialist critique that is rebuffing this um, kind of flirtation between science and spiritualism. And I love his quote. He writes, the only case of spiritualism I had the opportunity of examining for myself was a gross imposture. So he's basically saying it's a big fraud. But the good part is, he starts talking, if anybody would endow me with the faculty of listening to the chatter of old women and curates, so basically he, people who run uh, seances are just old women and priests, in the nearest cathedral town, I should decline the privilege, having better things to do. The only good I can see in the demonstration of the truth in spiritualism is to furnish an additional argument against suicide. Better live a crossing sweeper than die and be forced to talk twaddle by a medium hired at a guinea a seance. So basically, spiritualism makes dying so humiliating that it's best to stay alive. Now, Frederick Myers, on the other hand, the guy who's sinking slowly into the crud of materialism, he knows that this is super risky to be a scientist. Um, um, he's, a, he's at this point in the 1870s. He's gotten three firsts in Cambridge. He's a renowned poet. He's uh, been offered a philosophy chair at Cambridge. I mean, he's a major intellectual. His family is very high profile. He's friends with um, the Queen's son. And he is so desperate to find proof of a spirit world. He's willing to put that on the line. But he knows it's very chancy. And, he, um, and this is a, something, a letter he wrote. It's actually in his diary. And he's talking about a starlit walk, which he shall not forget. And he's basically laying it all out there. He's saying, look, and he's talking to his mentor, Henry Sidgwick, who is a moral philosopher, also hugely famous um, guy in, in Britain. And he's saying, look, I can't believe in God anymore. Everything's failed me. Tradition has failed me. I mean, I can't believe that stuff the church is saying anymore. I mean, it's been taken away from me by science. My intuition tells me that nothing is there. There's no metaphysics that I find convincing. Nobody's spiritual argument is doing it for me. I am alone in the universe. How do I solve this problem? And like a good Victorian, he understood there's only one way 
you are going to be able to prove to yourself there is a God, there is a spirit, that there is something more to this world, this world that Darwin has reduced to a pile of chemicals. Um, and he says, and uh, Sidgwick says, you know what we can do together? We can investigate spirits. That way, we can only find physical proof. So notice what's happening here. They're not approaching it intellectually. They're approaching it via the new code, right, of truth, right? The new idiom of truth. If you want to speak and say something that people are going to listen to, thanks to Compt, thanks to positivism, thanks to Locke, thanks to the scientific revolution, you want to be listened to, you need proof. And so Frederick Myers uh, and several other people embark on this, intel this the intellectual investigations of spiritualism. So now, just to give you a broader idea, there's a, di there's a society called the Dialectical Society. I think it's formed like in the 1850s, but really going strong in the 1860s. And they're actually a group of intellectuals. Uh, Charles Darwin's cousin is a member. Um, they have a lot of members, members from this Cambridge group. And they're actively trying to get scientists to investigate spiritualism. They know it's been very hokey. They know that a lot of people have been exposed as fraud. And they blame science, because they say, science, you've not taken responsibility for this. You've left this in the hands of curates and old women, as Huxley said. And we need to get to the truth of this, so we need real scientists. Now, um, enter William Crookes. William Crookes was, would eventually, by the way, get every honor you can possibly get as a scientist. President of the Royal Society, President of the British Association, um, uh, Medal for the Order of Merit, Copley Medal, Davies Medal. I mean, the guy is one of the most decorated scientists. Before I show you the picture of him walking with the ghost, please remember perhaps the most, well, one of the most decorated scientists of the 19th century, okay, not a fringe character. 1861, he popped onto the scene uh, and became quite famous because he actually discovered this um, element, thallium. And this is a spectroscope. And just to give you a sense of why this is, he's uniquely sort of qualified to investigate spiritualism. What you do with a spectroscope is that you heat up pieces of metal, or rather elements, a rock, anything. You heat it up, and then you read the radiation that it's emitting with a spectroscope. And every piece of matter right, has its unique signature. And he was able to discover thallium because he found that when he was looking at this hunk of rock, it start, a green line was glowing. And he'd never seen that before. It must be something new, so it was thallium. So you see how we get this odic idea right, that things emit this kind of spectral light and how that has been tied into the idea of ghostly energy that shows up in photographs. It's all kind of multiply determined. Um, and yet, when you are a chemist staring through a spectroscope, you are doing the most fastidious, boring, tedious work, staring, writing down you know, exactly what you're seeing. There's nothing theoretical here. So you have a guy who's doing the most kind of practical science, and science associated with the chemical industry, who now has decided he is going to investigate another force, psychic force. And he's going to do it in a way that it has never been done. He knows that the spirits and the ghosts and all of that are coming into ill repute. And the Dialectical Society has sort of taken him on as their chief scientist. And at their sort of urging, he's going to stage this incredible investigation of Dee Dee Home. Just so you know who Dee Dee Home is, he was probably the premier medium of the 19th century. And he was extremely famous. And even today, while most people have been discredited, people still resist discrediting Dee Dee Home. Because there are a couple of anecdotes about him and his powers that will not go away. Because, of course, the people who are attesting to this anecdote. He was seen by a group of lords, you see it in this picture right here, the right sort of people, earls, counts, that sort of thing. And he was actually seen to elevate, levitate, fly through an open window, exit the building, enter another window next door, and then walk into the room through the front door. He was seen 
by all these people. Now, if you knew anything about the aristocracy, they were probably drunk, but that didn't <laughs> matter. The fact that they are all swearing that they saw him do this has made him this sort of this credible mythology around him. And so even the Victorians were like, we've got to find out what it is about Dee Dee Holm. What, what, what is he doing? Does he have this, this magical power? And um, William Crookes decides, I'm going to insert him into a purely laboratory context, and I'm not going to investigate spiritual energy. I'm going to investigate his mental powers. Now, I think we were going to have a quiz, an, a, an attendance quiz. Are we good? But hold it. Should we? Is everybody prepared for that? OK, so then I'm going to we'll take up with the fun of spiritualism on Tuesday. <laughs>